the largest number they would practically appeal to. If it was bigger than myriads, they would just go myriads of myriads, lots. So big crowds, tens of thousands were there. And of course, hearing Jesus within that large, jostling, often unruly crowd who shouted out comments and questions would have been very difficult without any voice amplification like I have today. And so there was always a need to get closer, and as a result, they were trampling on each other. After so many thousands of people had gathered together, they were stepping on one another, verse 1 tells us. But increasingly, as we saw, the crowds were becoming more demanding, less respectful, and less accepting of Jesus' teaching. And they refused to accept the miracles as signs, as signs. Um, these are supernatural miracles that pointed to the fulfillment of Old Testament promises. They weren't just miracles to go ooh and ah over. They were supposed to say, oh, there's some significance in the Old Testament. This is pointing to something. That's what they were supposed to get, and that's what they were becoming increasingly dense toward. The signs established the authority of his teaching as the anointed sent one of God. But his teaching rubbed the self-righteous completely the wrong way. And so there was increasing rejection. So they wanted the benefits of God, but they didn't want God. Man, doesn't that sound familiar? Isn't that what it is today? People want the benefits of God. They want peace. They want, they'll put a bumper sticker on, uh, God is my co-pilot. And the way they drive, you think they should maybe change places. They want somebody who's going to be their business partner and give them insight into what the stock market is doing. They want all the benefits of God. They want to go to heaven. They just don't want God. As Jonathan Edwards once observed, very often these people want to go to heaven, but they would prefer if God went on long vacations away and they didn't have to actually deal with the person of God. They have no relationship with God. They just want stuff. Not that the, um, they didn't want God. They did not want the God of the Bible that commands and holds men to a standard, as his teacher says, uh, as, as his teaching was suggesting in uh, Luke 11, verse 29, we get a feel of that because he says, as the crowds were increasing, he began to say, this generation is a wicked generation. It seeks a sign, and yet no sign will be given to it as a sign of Joseph, Jonah. They were all around you and think, well, these are a bunch of religious people crowding around Jesus. What could go wrong? They were a wicked group of people who were surrounding Jesus. So, with tens of thousands surrounding him, Jesus began to teach his disciples first. That's what the passage says. In verse 1, he began saying to his disciples, first of all, protos, of first importance, he began speaking and teaching his disciples, while fully expecting that the rest were hungrily listening in. Some were listening in with the intent of trapping him, as 11, uh, chapter 33 and 34 would say. Um, but... Um, some, like in 12, verse 13, says, Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide his inheritance. Some wanted him to exercise authority over others, but not themselves. So in verse 35, now we're kind of back up to speed. In verse 35, he says, With all of that in mind, he began to teach the crowd that they needed to be prepared for the coming of the Messiah. They needed to be ready for the future unpredictable coming of the Son of Man. And of course, by using that term, Son of Man, he didn't just pull that out of the air. That was, again, something he should, that should have immediately twigged in people's remembrance. He is making a reference by calling himself the Son of Man. He is directly connecting the dots between him and the Messiah who was supposed to be coming in Daniel chapter 7. That's where the term is used. It is used of somebody who is in heaven, who is evidently God, but is also being referred to as the Son of Man. 
which up until this time was quite a mystery. How could that be? <clears throat> but he's connecting himself to the Messiah. And Jesus uses this important phrase about himself over 80 times in the Gospels. So they should have gathered that he, the Son of Man, was going to go away. He says, be prepared for the coming. And here's the Son of Man standing there. What they should have put together is he was going to go away and then he was going to come back. They should have put that together. He was going to go away and then returning, coming at a time that was unexpectable, unexpected and unpredictable. The entire ministry of John the Baptist was to herald, to prepare the way for the coming Messiah, the Son of God, the Son of Man. The people needed to be prepared, he kept on saying, be ready. And this again is the message of verses 35 to 40, be ready. In fact, read that. Again, he says, you too be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect. Okay, now you got the background now we hit into verse 41. Here we go. Peter said, Lord, are you addressing this parable to us or to everyone else as well? Who are you talking to? Jesus is addressing his comments first as a priority of the disciples, but as he does so, he's also anticipating unbelievers also listening in. And Peter's catching a bit of a flavor of that, and so He's wondering, who are you talking to here, Lord? He asks it openly. And Jesus answers this question somewhat indirectly. You'd say even somewhat mysteriously by telling yet another parable. And by telling the parable, huh, theologians and expositors are now asking a, a question concerning the new parable. Who are you talking to, Lord? I don't know if you read ahead, but uh, I do a lot of reading. I probably read over 30 commentaries on this particular passage. And you know what the absolute consensus was of who he's talking to? There was none. Everyone's sort of, well, I think he is, well, I think he is, and so forth. It, it's enigmatic. It's hard to nail down. Who is he talking to? Uh, so the, the theologians are now at the end of his parable saying, so he's, who is he talking to? And so with so many much better much trained theologians waffling and shifting on this one. I'll throw my hat in the ring. Here's how I have it reasoned out, and you see how this works. So here's how I have this reasoned out from the passage. First of all, there's a slave, steward, who might either be faithful or unfaithful. How do we know that? Well, he says... And the Lord said, Who then is a faithful and sensible steward whom his master will put in charge of his servants to give them their rations at the proper time? That's his task. Blessed is that slave whom his master finds so doing when he comes. So that's the good faithful slave. Or that's if this guy turns out to be faithful. Scoot down. But if that slave, same guy, if he turns out, he says in his heart, my master is a long time coming and so forth. If that same slave decides to go and be disobedient, here are the consequences for that. So, <clears throat> I understand there is this guy who is a slave steward who might be either faithful or unfaithful. If he's faithful, faithful, he'll be rewarded with greater responsibility, verse 44 says. If he's very unfaithful, in fact... As Jesus describes him, wicked and indulgent, he will be, and here's a great word, all the teenage boys at this point in time, their ears will be kind of going up and going, dichotomized, hacked to pieces. How's that for graphic? He said, if the, the unrighteous slave will be hacked to pieces by what? Fall into machinery? No. By the master. Seriously? Yeah. By the master. Hacked to pieces. Wow. Um, and, and that's not all. Then he will be assigned the same outcome of all the rest who are unfaithful 
That's called eternal hell. Wow. Wow. Hacked to pieces and sent to eternity in hell. What about the many lashes or few lashes in the verses to follow? That's fun for another day when we get there. Probably next time we look at the passage, open up the passage. We'll try and do that this morning. But anyway, there's a slave and he's called an oikonomos. Sounds a little bit like the word oikonomos economy for us, but it's related to the word household, and it means a household manager who's been given a responsible position over the other household servants, the other slaves. So he's called both titles. He's called this, this, this slave, but he's also in the same text called this term, which basically means a steward or a household manager. His expression of service was to be in charge of the, and then there another phrase is used, the domestic household staff servants. Okay, so in the household there were some dom domestic staff. If you were in jolly old Britain, you'd say, he's in charge of the domestics, right? So he would be kind of like the head butler in charge of all of the domestics. That's kind of the relationship that's being developed here. So, everyone in this story of the people are called a slave at some point because that defines their relationship to the master. Oh, and by the way, it, it defines your relationship to the master too. Whether you believe in God, whether you accept him as master, whether you are happy with that, whether you're pleased with that, or whether you're not. He's still your master, and you will be held to an account of him. Saved or unsaved, believer or unbeliever. That's the way it goes. Anyway, the slave in question, in his relationship to others, is in charge and responsible for their care and for their daily provision. That's what the idea of their portion was. Well, verses 42 to 44, consider what happens if he is a faithful household manager. Here's what it says. It says, Blessed is that slave whom his master finds so doing when he comes. He's going to be happier for it. It's a comparative. Truly, I say to you, he will be put him in charge of all his possessions. Man, he's going to have, out of his faithfulness, so much more responsibility put on him. Verses 45 and 46, if that slave, those verses consider what happens to a some, that same someone who's been put in charge over the household of the Lord, who uses the opportunity to mistreat the household staff and uses the resource to finance his own self-indulgence. That's what happens if you're a bad servant. So, Let's answer the basic question. Who is he talking to? Well, he's talking to the disciples and the crowd. Here's how I have it sorted out. For the apostles who are listening, it's an encouragement of how faithful service to Jesus is going to be rewarded. And it's also a warning of the consequences of the decisions should they defect, like Judas was soon to personally learn. For the other religious leaders who were there trying to catch on any word, trying to catch Jesus in some sort of a, a quandary or, or catch him up on his words, for the other religious leaders listening with hostile intent, it's a warning of what consequences wait for them. And for everyone else, it's a warning that sometimes the people who are in charge of things religiously are hypocrites. You know, uh, very often, young people, we're often really concerned with them, we hear about the failure, the falling, the falling into fraud, the, the, where, where they fall from grace, leaders in the church, and we go, oh boy, the, the young people are going to become so disillusioned. That's because we're not teaching them the Word of God. There's every expectation that that is going to happen. That shouldn't dis make you somehow disenchanted with Christianity. 
It's expected that there's going to be bad guys with a badge in the church. You, you need to understand that's going to happen. But you also need to understand that God as sovereign, ooh, he's going to take care of that. He's going to take care of that. That, that doesn't give anybody any license to be a bad guy themselves. What it does do is put you on your warning to know, do you know something? Just because this person is in charge, just because this person has a position of leadership, don't for a moment assume, oh, so he's a good guy. Ain't necessarily so. You might as well know that. And therefore you won't be super discouraged when the fallouts happen and they do regularly. Anyway, there are some people who are going to be in charge of things religiously, and they're hypocrites. They're unbelievers. <clears throat> and consequently, they're destined to be sliced to pieces by the Master, his words, and then dealt with for eternity in eternal punishment suited to their crime. Wow. And you might be thinking, why would... But would God permit evil, wicked men to have authority over genuine believers? Yes. Yes. Both Mary, the mother of Jesus, and her magnificent, and even way back, Nebuchadnezzar, in Daniel chapter 4, they observed God puts people into positions of authority as He chooses. He puts bad guys in authority over the entire nation of Israel, like Nebuchadnezzar, who was a rock star warlock, evil guy. He puts, he allows evil people to attain positions of authority. But he holds them accountable. And in the meantime, he suitably protects those that are his in the middle of that scrum. Good to know. Anyway, do not assume that if somebody's in authority, therefore these folks are believers or righteous or faithfully discharging the Lord's orders to the office. And that can happen. Somebody comes back from the mission field and we go, oh, there, the guy's a missionary. And so you hang on every word he says. Being a missionary doesn't mean that all of a sudden he can make papal declarations ex cathedra. Doesn't mean he is uh, an infallible guide to the word of He might not even be saved. Just because a person has a position in the structure of the word of God does not mean he's going to behave properly. Well, we'll talk more about that the next time we're in this passage. But so... I. You know, I, I've been away for a month and people are going, oh boy, Howard, he's at it again. He's talking about hell and cutting people to pieces. What in the world, right? One time back in a, in a month and all of a sudden he's, he's hacking people to pieces. What's, what's he with? Um, actually, that's just going to be the natural consequences of verse by verse covering the Word of God because then you end up dealing with in ratio exactly how Jesus taught, right? And, and you'll be getting some sort of an idea of the ratio that Jesus taught about these subjects. And if you see them coming up a lot, it's in the text. And we don't pick and choose. Anyway, today, thankfully, we're going to talk about the encouraging news. The good, we're, we're going to consider the good slave, the good steward. Two qualities Jesus is looking for in those he places his a household in charge of. Two things are faithfulness and, as the a New American Standard says, faithful and sensible. If you're following along in a legacy Bible, it puts it faithful and prudent. Uh, faithful and wise manager, ESV has. Well, the first quality is faithful, which means he does what he's told. And does what he's told with diligence, attention to detail, swiftness, and an eagerness the master can approve of and reward. That's what it means to be faithful. The second quality is 
phronomos in the Greek, from phrain, which means the mind, related to the mind. Phronomos means his service is mindful, his service is thoughtful. So the guy is deep thinking and right thinking. The outcome of that servant being diligent, faithful, and deep thinking and right thinking is that the slave is blessed, happy, joyful. And that's the word from the benedictions of the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed is, are the pure, blessed are, happy is the idea, happy. The servant steward was faithful and used his head because he really believed that the master was the master. And that he was returning. And his obedience was of some real significance and consequence in eternity. And that the master would reward diligent, intelligent, and faithful service in generous, generous grace. Grace. Well, what could verse 44 mean? Truly I say to you that he will put him in charge of all his possessions. What's that talking about? Well... This concept of faithfulness being rewarded is taught in several other places and elaborated on so we don't have to guess. About six or seven months later, he uses exactly the same setup and then gives a lengthier description of what that means in Luke chapter 19. We would turn there, but that would steal all my thunder when I get there. So we're going to go to a different passage, Matthew 25. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 25. That way you get teaching from Luke and you get teaching from Matthew. Actually, scoot a moment to Matthew 24 so you see the context. Matthew 24, verse 45. Who then is a faithful and sensible slave whom his master put in charge of his household to give them food in their proper time. You see, same context. He's, this is several months later. He's setting it up the same way. It's the same teaching. Obviously, this is important to him. He's repeating it. Blessed is that slave whom his master finds so doing when he comes. Truly, I say to you, he'll put him in charge of all his possessions. And then it gives the negative but if that evil slave says in his heart, my master's long coming, and so forth. See, it's the same setup, but this time he gives a little more discussion of what does it mean put in possession, put in charge of all my possessions. Turn, if you would, to verse 14 of chapter 25. So, next, like the, the next story after the, the one immediately following. For it is just like a man, verse 14, about to go on a journey. So, same idea. He's going to go away, and he's going to come back. So he goes on a journey. He called his own slaves and entrusted his possessions to them. Okay, same setup. To one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, each, to another one, each according to his own ability, and he went on his journey. Okay, so the master goes away, leaving stewardship of his valuables, his possessions, uh, to his servants. So that's interesting to know. We, we got the idea. Then he comes back after a long time and insists on an accounting. That's verse 19. In this analogy, the Lord gives them talents, is the term. And in our language and time, a talent is an ability. Oh, is that person ever talented? You should hear them with an oboe or whatever, right? Is that person ever talented? You should see them with a curling iron. I I have no direct knowledge of what that is. Anyway, that's what we understand by talent as an ability. In this language and with this timestamp, talent is a certain weight of either silver or gold. A common talent, which we'll go on the assumption is, is a particular weight of precious metal. A royal talent was double whatever we're talking about. Okay? So, 
a, a common talent of gold would be, I checked it out according to last trading at about 7 o'clock Saturday, because this is important to you, uh, it would be worth about $2.5 million, a talent of gold. A talent of silver would be worth about $28,500 Canadian. All right? So that's the lotments. Well, verse 14, he says, they're given according to their dunamis, which is where we get our word dynamite, but really what it's talking about, according to their natural ability as assessed by the master. The master figures out this guy can safely, can faithfully handle about this much, is what he's saying. Well, immediately, verse 16, the one who had received the five talents went and traded with them and gained five more talents. So he didn't just kind of wait around. He kind of put this in right away, immediately. Okay, so, um, and, the, and the word here, traded, is a very interesting word again. It means earned by working, laboring, investing, laboring and, and doing business. That's what the term means. So he immediately took that money, and which is uh, five times 28,500 is real quick, somebody? Right, lots. So he took all of that money, and he did something with it very quickly, but he didn't just kind of throw it out there. It involves working, laboring, doing business. Well, the next one, in the same manner, the one who had received two talents gained two more. So there's a guy with a little less natural ability, but he worked just as hard and he was both faithful and prudent as he was able. And now we have a third guy. But he who received one talent went away and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. We're going to talk more about him the next time. But just for the sake of it, you go, that's not fair. How come he only got one talent? How many here, if somebody came along and dumped into your hand $28,500 worth of silver, you're going, oh, how come I didn't get a million? Have any of you had it so somebody just dumps $28,000 into your lap and says, go do something with it? Okay, so the guy who got one talent, it's not like he got shortchanged, Okay. Um, just so that you know, um, another interesting thing here, it says he hid his master's money. And so now we know whether it was gold or silver. It's silver. The word money here is the word for silver coins. So basically, the guy who got one talent of silver got $28,500 worth of silver, which would have been, I don't know how many of you collect precious, any of you collect precious metals? You won't admit to it now anyway, because you think it's a trap. But if you did and you have those little fist size tubes, it means you got nine of them. Nine of those coins by today's value. Okay? So, interesting. He got nine It'd be 220 silver shekels, or about nine of those fist-sized tubes. So, and, and of course the guy that got five talents got five times that many. He's got 1,100 coins. Now, verse 19, after a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. There's a little bit of a hint here. It says, after a long time. There's supposed to be some expectation that it could be a while that he goes away and it's a little while before he comes back. That doesn't mean that you don't live like he could come back any time that you're supposed to do. But it very well could be that there's a little bit of time involved here is what he's saying. And he says, and he came and he settled accounts with the individual. When the master came, the slave gave an account. He had some explaining to do. By the way, just so you know, so do you. So will you. You know, 
<clears throat> I had a math teacher in grade seven, and he had this little habit I absolutely hated. I, I hated math, which I think is very defensible. I hated math. But more than that, I hated a legal size piece of, of full scap, they called it. One page. There'd be a blank page when we walked in on our desk and we go, oh no, pop quiz. And pop quiz did not mean we get to tell everything we know about Coca-Cola. It meant there's a quiz, there's a test, it matters, and we didn't see that one coming. I hate those surprise tests. And I don't want any of you to face that too. All of you are stewards. All of you have received something from the Lord. That's why there is something specific to believers called the Bema of Christ, the judgment seat of Christ. And it's not a situation where be, you'll be able to sit back and say, and, and somebody says some nice things about you like some sort of a celebrity roast. Not at all. You will stand up and from your mouth give an account. Here's what was given to me. And believe me, down to the last chicken, a record has been kept. And you will give an account, and therefore, of the stuff you gave me, here's what I've done with it. I don't want you to walk into heaven and go, what, what, what's that blank piece of paper waiting on the desk for? Pop quiz? Judgment? I, I never heard anything about that. You've heard about it. You will give an account for everything that God has given you as a disciple. Now, from the point of view of those of you who are saved, and those of you the only ones who are ever going to get to the beam of Christ, because that happens in heaven, right after the rapture, but, but believers are the only ones who are going to get there, and it's not a situation of heaven or hell. It's a situation of... Did you do something worthwhile? Did you do something to the glory of God? Or did you do something and use all this stuff for yourself? And the outcome of that is either rewards or, eh, not so much reward. That's the outcome of it. It's not that you're going to, therefore, not make heaven. Everybody at the beam of Christ, ah, they're in heaven. Done. As the Irish would say, you're in heaven with the door locked. You're, you're safe. You're saved. But now the quality of your service is being evaluated, and those who worked harder, were more diligent, they will get greater reward. Hey, that makes sense, right? That makes sense. That's the beam of Christ. So there's some splaining to do, and you go, well, I don't know if, if I've heard of that. I don't know if uh, I've seen that in Scripture. Well, let's turn to Romans chapter 14 for a minute. Romans chapter 14. In the passage which says, it's talking about don't be judging another man's servant about what he does with his liberty, with what he does with the freedom he has. Verse 10, but why, but you, why do you judge your brother or you again? Why do you regard your brother with contempt? He says, for we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. Judgment seat, the word bima. We'll all stand before the bima of God. For it's written, as I live, says the Lord, meaning this is pretty sure. Every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall give praise to God. So then, each one of us, who would that include? Oh, yeah, each one of us will give an account of himself to God. I will actively say, here's what I did with the stuff you gave me, Lord. Huh, look at that. Do you know something? More specifically, pastors are going to do that. Pastors are going to do that. Um, turn, if you would, to Hebrews. This is one of the ones that is scary for preachers. 
Preachers get to scare everybody just about every Sunday. Preachers need something that, in their life to keep, you know, that's scary for them. Uh, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17, Obey your leaders, submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls, who, as those who will give an account. Let them do the, with, this with joy, not with grief, for this would be profitable, unprofitable to you. There is going to come a day where I will be held to account. Say you had this personnel, you had these people who were available in the body of Christ, you had these people that you were supposed to be shepherding and taking care of. How'd you do? And it won't be uh, somebody just, you know, kind of ripes in that little dot uh, on a number line of zero to ten. I have to stand up and give an account for how I handled situations. Wow. That, that's enough to make one want to go on sabbatical again. But anyway, that, it, it's a joy to be a, a pastor, but I, I have to give an account for how I pastor, how I teach, if I deal with sin, all of those things. Anyway, there's a different judgment seat for unbelievers. And that's called the great white throne judgment. It's at a very different time, a different place, and everyone who is at that one is staring down the gun barrel of an eternity in hell. Everyone at the judgment seat of Christ goes to hell. Everyone will be thrown alive into the lake of fire. The judgment determines the degree of punishment, and we're going to see that as we look at the unfaithful servant. For all unbelievers, the length of sentence is the same. Eternity. Everybody goes into hell for eternity. There's no return. How tolerable is the question. In our Luke passage as well as in Matthew passage, there are slaves who are unfaithful, unbelieving, wicked and indulgent who are required to give an account because they're handling the master's assets. And we're going to study that the next time. Well, back to Matthew chapter 25 for a bit. Matthew 25, <clears throat> verse 20. He's got some splaining to do, so he does. The one who had received the five talents came up and brought five more talents, saying, Master, you entrusted five talents to me. See, I have gained five more talents. And there's some at this point in time who say, so the guy's a thief or he's a, he's a you know, he's some sort of a, a uh, weasel. No, no, he, he, he earned it. He would have done it through investment and he would have done it through hard work. The slave did some good things. The slave never lost sight of the fact that the assets belonged to the master, not him. He said, here is the stuff that you entrusted to me. What a great concept. What a great thought to keep to the front of your thinking as you get up every morning. It's not my pickup. It's the Lord's pickup. You know, it, it, it's not my house. It's the Lord's house. This is the Lord's daughter, who's my wife, that I'm supposed to be caring for. Belongs to the Lord. The Lord's children under my roof to care for and train. They're entrusted to me. The Lord's bank account, not mine to spend on whatever whim takes me. It's the Lord's daytimer. Do you think, think about this for a minute, a slave, and he's in the slave ship, and he's pulling at the oar, and there's a guy at the front going, bong, bong. Bong. And every time he goes bong, I'm supposed to pull on the oar. I'm supposed to pull on the oar. Does he ever put up his hand and say, I think, I think I'm getting a bit of a blister here. And I don't, I'm not feeling it anymore. I, I think I need a little bit of me time at the shore for a bit. Do you, do you think slaves did that? No, because the next bong would be on your head. Bong on your head. You keep pulling at the oar. You, you didn't, if you're a slave, you didn't decide what I'm going to do on Thursday. The Lord did. 
So, quick question. Is the Lord your master? Who decides your timetable? Who are you working for? The kingdom of God or the empire of self? You, you got to get up in the morning and you say, do you know something? All of these things the Lord has entrusted me with. It's the Lord's daytimer. It's the Lord's me. Everything I have, my body. He owns everything about me. A slave owns nothing, including his own belly button. Master owns it all. Belongs to the master. Anyway, this slave has been successful because he kept it in mind. He kept in mind the term entrusted. Now, this slave has a bigger bundle, which always means more responsibility and more accountable. But he's been faithful with all of that. And what he's rewarded with is greater responsibility, greater opportunity to serve in the future. And is there any of you here who are thinking, oh, we get m more stuff to be responsible for and more work, and you're thinking, I don't even think I want that. We'll deal with that in a minute. Anyway, he's, got, he's been rewarded with greater opportunity to serve in the future. Here, now do that more. Um, with a greater portfolio, and he says, with that, enter into joy. Wow. He says, I put you in charge of many things. Enter into joy, the joy of your master. Beautiful. Also, the one who had received the two talents came up and said, Master, you entrusted two talents to me. See, I have gained two more talents. Well, the master had accurately judged about what that slave could handle if he kept his head down and worked hard. He'd been given 440 coins, or 18 tubes. If he had been given a bundle of 45 tubes of silver, well, it might have swamped him, right? Might not have done as well. Might not have been able to handle it. Well, I want to give you a little bit of a word about the bima. The bima. We looked at it in Romans chapter 14. It's also in 2 Corinthians chapter 5.10. Let's look there real quick. 2 Corinthians 5.10. <clears throat> Verse 10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the potty according to what he's done, whether good or bad, meaning profitable or unprofitable. Or 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Let's look at that. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. We get a great illustration that Paul draws on. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. He's talking to the people in Corinth. And Corinth was the sporting center, kind of, of Europe. Now, all of you guys have heard of the, the Olympic Games, right? But they were kind of small peas, because that only happened every four years. And they weren't as big as the Ismithian Games, which occurred in Corinth. In the Ismithian Games, much bigger, way more athletes involved, what happened was... They had a big circle around, quite a big circle, because you could race you know, chariots around there, kind of like a pony chariot thing. And in the center of that was a raised platform that the judges sat on and watched the participants. And it was called, anyone want to guess? Right, the bima. The bima. They sat on the bima. And here's the thing that, as we watched it, we'd be going, these Greeks are mad. Because what they would do is the judges would be there watching, and, and the, the runners, for example, in, in the racers, the different people who were doing any of the, the, the racing, they would be doing the most chaotic things. There'd be one guy, and he'd be getting ready, and all of a sudden he'd take off like a streak. Run, who knows how far, and then quit. And there'd be one guy, and he's just kind of doing the boom, boom, boom. And he's just going and going and going. And some, they're, they're going in different directions. They're going at different times. 
They're going different distances. They're going different speeds. You go, how in the world are you going to keep track of that? Well, the judges are doing that. What they would be looking at is they'd be saying, so how is this guy built? Is he built for long term, long distance? Okay, so how is he doing compared to how his ability is? And they'd see some guy and he's got, you know, arms like Schwarzenegger, which is actually pretty good for sprinting. You get the momentum, right? He's, and he's just, you know, he's, he's absolutely, he's got, you know, pipes like a plumber. And he's just ready to go. And he takes off and he goes really fast for a short distance. And you go, okay, so given what he has, how's he doing? And so the judge would not say, okay, the guy who gets across this line gets first. No. He'd say, the guy who is doing the best did the best training, did the best with what he had, wins. Wins what? Gold medal? No. No, that'd be counterproductive. So they didn't get to go up on a podium and go the number one and all that. What they did was, they'd say, you're the one that's a winner. The guy would come up, only one winner, and they would put a Stephanos on his head. It was a laurel wreath or a pine bough, something like that. Put it on his head. And he wouldn't stand up and go, you know, take the applause, take three bows. He would trot out of there as quick as he could. And he would take that pine bough and he would put it at the altar of the God he wished to serve. And through that, he took all of that training, all of that effort, all of that talent, and he used it as a mechanism to worship, very often, a false god. Paul says, do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives a prize? Run in such a way that you may win. Run hard. Run hard. Everyone who competes in the games exercises self-controls in all things. So you don't just eat whenever you want, sleep whenever you want, do whatever you want. You've got a goal. There's disciplining. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, which they deposit, but we an imperishable. That's why that whole picture in Revelation about taking your crowns and placing it before your master Before God. That's where that fits in. You are taking your life, activity, effort, sacrifice, and you're using it as a means that has been quantified in this crown and use it as an uh, an ability to worship your God. And so he says, therefore, I run in such a way as not without aim. So in other words, I don't just kind of veer all over the place. I'm pretty disciplined. He changes the illustration. I box in such a way as not beating the air. I'm not just sort of shadow boxing. Uh, if, if I'm in a fight, I, I'm not, you know, kind of styling it up and, and showing off to the crowd. Boy, you wouldn't. In, in our uh, Olympic Games, the guy who comes in second wins what? Silver medal. That's not too cheesy. In the Smithian Games, the guy who comes in second gets what? Right, your eyes eyes gouged out. Man, there's there's motivation to win here, right? Uh, Because of the consequences. I don't shadow box, I'm pretty disciplined. I discipline my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be adakamos, disqualified. Um, life's a race. There is a dais, a bima, and the judge is watching. He's measuring what he gave you, what abilities you have, and what you're doing with what you were given. If you didn't know that before, man, I have a responsibility to make sure you know it now. How you are living your life and what you are doing with the resources, the talents, the time God has given you, 
matters. It is being carefully analyzed by Christ. And that's a good thing. Because there's some people who are working hard, and there are some people who are, you know, just kind of whistling along, serve if I feel like it, whatever. Well, a word about the Bema. Faithfulness, even with humble resources, is never inconsequential. What we have in our hands is all his stuff, and he's tracking it carefully. Interesting. Um, history tells of a group of people who kind of got captured by that thought. And as they would pass each other in the street, they would shout out to each other, remember the bima. That's a great little habit. We should do that once in a while with each other. Remember the bima. Your hard work, your sacrifice, everything you're doing, as a believer, it matters. And there's going to be a reward. There's some consequence to it. Another thing, we all know other servants, other slaves who've been entrusted with more, don't we? They got the great financial start. We didn't. They got the great education and the winsome good looks. They got sterling health and wonderful natural abilities. They got the energy and the intellect. They got the windfall. If I look at the greater endowments of others and reason, you know, if I'd been given that start, wow, how much more ease I would have today, how much more comfortable I would be, how much less sweat I would have on my brow through the day, and how much more respect would I be given. I'm badly, badly mistaken, and I'm totally out of it. To whom much is given, much is required. More stuff to handle means more requirement to turn a profit for the master and more accountability, not for more comfort and ease. If greater endowments results in greater slothful ease, less care and a higher standard of living on my part, I will be a sorry pooch at the bima when I give an account, right? That's the way it was. That kind of thinking is sure to see me in trouble with my accounting. So, folks, just do wonderfully with what God has given you. Use that prudently, creatively, and faithfully, and don't be always saying, man, if I had more, be content. Choose contentment with what you have been given and be diligent with that. It's only a short time and faithful servants who are believers are going to be given what? All the possessions of the master. In so small a time, folks, you won't have any need. In so small a time, you won't have to be scrimping. In so small a time, you won't be going, I don't know if we're going to make it. You'll have unlimited resources. It's just in this very small breath of a time frame here where he's given us a little and wants us to do something with it. So steal yourself for that reality. Be content with that. Now, got one more piece of business as we close. Some here might be thinking, but if I work hard and the stuff is not even mine and it's all profit for the master who owns me and everything else, anyway, why knock yourself out? Did that thought cross your mind? The guy who has everything, the master, surely doesn't need more. If I work hard, I just get re rewarded by having even more work, even harder responsibilities in the future. Do you hear the news that faithfulness to the Master will result in greater capacity to serve and, and reason? So why get on that treadmill? 
How could that result in any joy? None of it will be mine for me to enjoy on me anyway. If that's what's running through your head, be sure to come here for the next sermon in this series, and we'll study all about that. The wicked servant who buried his 220 coins gets thrown into outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth, and the unfaithful servant who gets dichotomized, hacked to pieces, and thrown into eternal fire. Because that's where that goes. Folks, being able to serve the Master is a joy and a privilege. And whether, as a believer, you embrace it or not, that is the reality. You've got a Master. He's given you stuff. There is an accounting to give. We've got to do something for the Master. And besides that, serving the Master is fun. Serving the Master is joy. It's a privilege. I hope you've had the chance to experience that truth. I hope for you that service is joy. Service, even very hard, exhausting, occasionally painful work, is fun. I hope You automatically say, yeah, no, I get that. Look who we're serving. What a privilege. Look who gets greater profit and glory. And if you really love the Lord Jesus Christ, and I trust you do, if he gets greater glory, if he gets greater profit, you're going, yeah, that's worth it. Right? If I love Christ supremely, what a great motivator. I know Christ is entitled to our service because I'm a slave and he's the master. Yet in his grace, he will reward us for that which is only to be expected of us. Any reward we might receive is an indication of his generosity, the generosity of the Lord. And the reward is extravagantly greater than the service and the faithfulness we would remember. And so could I, as I conclude, just kind of run this by you? If you're a believer here, remember the Bema. It's going to be worth it. The momentary light affliction of this world cannot be compared with the glory that will be revealed in us. Amen? Amen? If you're a believer, remember the Bema. If you're here today and you're not a believer, remember the great white throne. Because if your sins are not paid for in Christ, they will be paid by you and never quite paid in a place called the lake of fire. You need to have your sins paid for in Christ. You cannot dare die in your sins. Don't do it. Your sins, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought, the sins, not in part, but the whole, can be today nailed to the cross and you bear them no more. Bigger than that, you get imputed to your account the righteousness of Christ as a gift. And you can walk into heaven because legally you belong there. You can walk out precisely like that. Don't walk out of here being under the wrath of God still under your sins. Remember the great white throne. Heavenly Father, thank you for the wonderful assurance that any of the diligent service we would render to you is going to be, first of all, observed, quantified, and then given a wonderful, gracious reward. What what an encouragement. What an encouragement that our service could be something that would bring joy and bring glory to our Lord and Savior. So Lord, help us, those of us who name the name of Christ, help us this week to remember the Bema 
to be using anything, all of our powers, all of our abilities, all of our assets, and, and marshal them all so that they are doing something for the kingdom of God this week. It will work for our eternal joy, and it will work for your glory. And we ask these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I'll call on our song leaders one more time.